Hey, who'd y'all bring in here with you? Well, we're going to do something a little different today, JT. You know, this show is about the Mississippi outdoors. Sure. But today, we're talking about, we're going way back in the outdoors. Way, way back. Way in back. The outdoors. All right. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to talk about some fossils and some dinosaur bones and some other cool stuff. We brought uh, Mr. George Phillips with us, who is the paleontologist at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. So he's going to talk about the, the Mississippi outdoors of way, way a long time ago. Before the radio existed. I'll give yeah. you – and, right. and I, will, I will give you something impressive. Uh-oh. I can spell paleontologist. <laughs> I learned how to spell that back when I was in school. Well, that – I mean – you know, every little kid wants to be a paleontologist, right? That's what you want to do when you grow up when you're six, right? You want to go dig dinosaur bones And only or they can pronounce the names. <laughs> That's right. All right, well, let's uh, tell you what, George. Hang loose just a second. We're going to come to you. Let's uh, get a little house cleaning done here uh, and uh, get started here with the situation in the, in the South Delta. Uh, no regulation changes yet. Uh, still uh, discussing that. Is that public? Is that public things still right. happening yeah um so you know the the situation over there the, the water's receding and and um you know we've been doing um surveys of of the wildlife for uh, a number of weeks a couple of months now we're going to continue that for a little longer getting a lot of uh, a lot of questions about what are we going to do for the deer season in the south delta and a lot of the listeners may have seen the survey that went out the online survey that went out what week four last i think mm-hmm. um so we have not made a decision on that yet um but look to make that decision sometime this month i anticipate probably uh mid august we're going to try to make that call on what the regs for the south delta will be so i know we're getting a lot of a lot of people calling in at the office uh, a lot of people stopping us on the street asking so there's a lot of talk about that but that decision has not been made yet but we we look to make it you know sometime this month yeah, and so that survey is still up until the 11th of August. If you want to go and check it out and knock out a survey, it takes 15 seconds. It's very, very minimal. Um, one thing that people need to you know, continue to think about is, is receding but slowly. So the, the levels on, in Steel Bio, which hold all that water in that backwater area, the, the riverside is quite a bit lower than the land side, but it jumped last week for – some odd reason maybe some rain whatever you know all that rain that still falls is it hasn't started just rolling out yet and so um it's still pretty high and it's covering a lot of ground over there but that's something that um we're monitoring every day we met about it last week on friday discussed some things about the season and and uh chewed on some of that stuff so like adam said it'll be later this month and just keep tabs on it i'm i'm very surprised the people that are in favor of just letting it letting it letting it go for a year and and not hunting that area people that actually hunt there because i think they know what it's going to be like to be be honest with you but a lot of people that support this and are are, yeah. are wanting and the resource are, to rebound a, there's a lot of uh, private landowners that that want the opportunity you know oh, because know. there are um there's some 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 opportunities to you know not uh necessarily provide all that we can for the deer if we close it um and we discussed some of that last week sure. so and it's a big decision and um, yeah. and I, I think whatever decision y'all come to will be the right one because you're going about it the right way getting studying it uh, and using the two heads are better than one mm-hmm. including That's the right. public. and like we talked about last week you know this is a unprecedented situation that you know the normal process of coming up with regs doesn't really fit well into because we we really don't know the full impact of the flood and we're not going to know the full impact uh for a while so all right uh talk to me about this new check-in app for yeah the so we want to spend a little time on that today um wma hunters this year are, are going to have a, a a new way to check into the wmas you know typically in the past if you go hunt a wildlife management area uh, you know, regardless of, of any species. Actually, if you visit a wildlife management area, no matter what you're doing, even if you're, you're not necessarily hunting there, you uh, all of our wildlife management areas have a, a kiosk with paper check-in. Right. We're, we're getting up with technology. We're moving away from that. So this year we're going to have an app available to do that. Um, the app has not been released yet, but uh, we're, we're in the final stages of it, and we're 
this year hunters are, are going to need to use that app to check in to, to the WMAs. And it actually, I think it's going to be a really, really uh, good step in the right direction. Um, you know, the technology now is such that you can, you can get an app to do just about anything. Similar to the Game Check app that we did for turkey season, this is one that you don't have to have cell coverage for it to work. Uh, basically, you enter your, your contact info um, and you – you know, tell what you did, mm-hmm. what you, you know, if you if you harvested anything, you report that on the end. It will, in my mind, it's going to be a lot more convenient on the hunter, a l- heck of a lot quicker. If you, if, you know, if you hunt a WMA, it takes a little time. Um, depending on how you enter a WMA, you know, you may have to go pretty far out yeah. of your way to go to one of those physical right. check-ins with the cards. Yeah. You got to spend a couple of minutes filling it out. Mm-hmm. This thing, you don't have to do either of those. Once yeah, so I, I, I have been testing the, the little app. And it was it's really quick. You got to set up a profile, similar to what you did with the, the right. turkey harvest. Set up that profile, gives you some specifics, uh, your address, your date of birth, your tag number on your truck if you want to. Right. Basically the same questions that have always been there on right. those cards. Mm-hmm. Nothing new we just, there. We just put it on the app. Right. And so, like you were saying, I've been to WMAs before where the nearest check-in station to where I wanted to hunt was you know a mile, two miles around the Sometimes way. More than that, yeah. You may you have, may run up on a bridge, just been closed, minutes. and da 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 da. And this allows you when you leave your house, you're in your driveway, you can actually check in and say it takes you an hour to get there. You can plug in the day that you can't plug in any other day than the the day that you're currently living in, and and you you select it and you can actually check in for say six o'clock a.m. six a.m. If it takes you an hour to get there, you can set it to, to a time, and you're checked in. You drive straight to your spot, and you're there. You're done. You don't have to um, run around there and get a card, yada, yada, yada. So it's going to be a, uh, a really beneficial thing to try to streamline that process for the people who utilize management areas. Yep. I think it's going to be a really good thing moving forward. And um, so we're, we're implementing that this year. That will be the way you check in at mm-hmm. WMAs for this upcoming and, and hunting season, which will go into effect, you know, on the opener of Dove. Yeah. September and one thing that people need to be aware of is it is a separate app than our agency app with the like the sunrise, sunset, the regulation right, the, stuff. The MDWFP. It fish. looks the same. Okay. It looks similar, but it actually, you know, is called the WMA check-in app. So MDWFP. If you already have, um, obviously, the app loaded on your phone, it would just ask you to open it. But if you don't have that WMA check-in app, you would just download it, put it on there. It'd be, it's a separate entity. It's not held within right. the MDWFP, and main it's not app. available yet. But right. we're we're wanting listeners. We're we're wanting to plant that seed with listeners that there's something they're going to need to do. So we'll keep reminding folks for the next several weeks. Will it help with locations? Will it, will it help you know if other pe- or where other people are? Or is that no? It won't have any of that kind okay. of feed. It's not going to track your your actual location. Mm-hmm. It's essentially doing the exact same job the cards have historically right. done draw hunts all applications yep, draw are now hunts, open right draw hunts are open for a bunch of stuff um early teal for a lot of wmas through the 15th now that that's for wmas except for howard miller howard miller's been impacted by the flood over there uh, as have a lot of the, the big deer areas like mahana and those so those are postponed for now um but early till for some areas through the 15th we've got some deer draws uh that are open through the 31st to apply for rabbit as well and youth dove um so we're doing our youth dove a little differently this year it's going to be a draw hunt um the the big youth dove hunt that we we typically have on mahana because mahana has been underwater and is still underwater it'll be on muscadine um but muscadine should be a pretty good pretty good pool there too black prairie as well so go check those out all those draw hunts are open some of them will be closing here in about a week um but yep that's all up first uh mentor hunts on black prairie and pearl river wmas talk about this this is a really cool thing yeah we're gonna we're gonna have really uh, cool we're gonna have megan fedrick in here next week talking about hunter ed so we may go into this a little more detail but yeah this is something new we're doing this year uh to try to recruit new hunters and this is really you know we've done a lot of youth hunter recruitment stuff over the years but this is really going to be aimed more at adults so adults who may have an interest or want to learn to hunt um, they can apply for these mentor hunts we're going to kind of 
do them on two areas this year as sort of a little pilot project, Black Prairie WMA and Pearl River WMA. So these are aimed at people 18 years of age and older who do not currently hunt but would like to learn. You're going to be paired with uh, a mentor, paired with someone who is an experienced cool hunter, and they're going to take you out and teach you what they know. Uh, but if you want to do very, that— very, very quiet. <laughs> mm. Right, right. If you mm. want to do that, um, <laughs> there is an application process and those applications we're taking them right now through august the 15th so go check the website out and like i said we'll have we'll have megan in here next week and we'll probably get more into into that because that's kind of her her ballpark that's so. gonna be cool though man to yeah. give people an opportunity we get people in the woods all right george phillips you're up to bat here we go he's a paleontologist at the mississippi museum of natural science as uh, uh well uh, it seems like you must have Every kid's a dream job hunting for dinosaur bones. Uh, was that something you always wanted to do? It was, and I did just that around what now is today the Black Prairie WMA. Oh, cool. yeah. In it and around it there in the Golden Triangle. Wow. Yeah, you can find all those seashells and stuff there. Oh, yeah, yeah lots of seashells cool in that area. Cool the seafloor is right near the surface there, Adam. <laughs> so tell me about a typical day for you, would you? Well, uh, a lot of kids probably wouldn't like my typical day. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, I'm not playing with dinosaur bones or anything like that during the day. Um, most of the day, well, part of the day I am. I, I do work with a lot of fossils, but, you know, there's a lot of paperwork and humdrum involved with it, too. But it's all to meet the greater end, and that's to study Mississippi's ancient biodiversity. Um, the paleontology program was uh, established in 1978. That's about the same year that uh, the agency took over uh, the Natural Heritage Program, which began in 1976. And my function, or the paleontology program's function, is very similar in the sense that I'm out there documenting not just uh, individual fossil occurrences, but important fossil sites, um, important uh, discoveries. Uh, and we're not look, just looking at uh, looking for new species all the time, but we're also, which is a large part of the job, but we're also looking at uh, species communities, very much like what the Natural Heritage Program does with modern living communities, except what I'm looking at is not endangered, except for maybe under the blade of a of a uh, bulldozer or something but it's actually uh, excavations that actually expose the things i study so i'm always falling around heavy equipment all right i gotta ask you this question and it's really not something i'm just out of the blue where is where is the most concentrated fossils in mississippi where can you where i mean where is the 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 hot spot if you will well uh right there in northeast mississippi where i grew up uh there's a quite a dense concentration of fossils but the jackson metro area is another location so you you can't you can't dig any deeper than uh say eight to nine feet and not encounter seafloor material there in downtown jackson or just really anywhere within the metro area um uh, the Meridian area, some famous discoveries have occurred around the Meridian area, uh, namely at the Red Hot Truck Stop. Mm -hmm. um, but the northeast Mississippi dinosaur belt is rich with, with fossils. and that's now, now, wait a minute. I, I've got to interrupt here. Mm -hmm. What happened at the Red Hot Truck Stop? Oh, man. You can't, you can't <laughs> tease me there discovery. without telling yeah. it's, a, it's a lot more than good food, good eats, <laughs> as the sign used to say. Um, they were right behind the Red Hot Truck Stop uh, in the 1970s. A gentleman who I was lucky enough to procure last year as a research adjunct, uh, a researcher adjunct here at the Museum of Natural Science. He'd been retired for a number of years, but he's the one that discovered the importance of the fossils behind the Red Hot Truck Stop. He's now 87 years old and battling cancer. But uh, Jerry, in the late 1970s, reported these fossil discoveries first to uh, Princeton. Wow. Of all places. He, he had not yet had a working relationship with the Office of Geology in the state, and, and this was a few years before we had a paleontology program at, the, at MMNS and before it was widely known. But, yeah, right behind the Red Hot Truck Stop there, there are lots of shark teeth, uh, ray teeth, uh, and bones and cartilage thereof. Um, but the most important discovery, perhaps, is the remains of over 30 different species of early terrestrial mammal, including an early primate, uh, right behind the old Red Hot truck stop there. Hmm. Uh, this was uh, made national news in 2008. Um, I think it was the New York Times had a good spread of, of it in one of their pages, and 
illustrated what this creature looked like. It was about six and a half inches long, including the tail. So this is a very early primitive primate. Wow. So uh, talk a little bit about the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science Paleontology Program and what the objectives are. Yeah, so uh, again, we came into existence 41 years ago this year. In fact, this month, uh, later this month is the 41st anniversary. And what we're doing is is uh, we're taking in reports of people that call in and find something. Most of the time, we're identifying fossils for people. Um, but sometimes people report something that we haven't seen before or that, that needs investigating. And so if I've got any money in the kitty, I'll travel over there to uh, wherever the location may be. And often it is northeast Mississippi or somewhere in central Mississippi. Um, in fact, I was in Meridian recently uh, looking into reports over there. And I just got back from northeast Mississippi uh, looking at Cretaceous fossils around Starkville, Mississippi, uh, the important specimens of which were, were donated on that trip. So, yeah, just the, the paleontology program is out there documenting uh, all the many different species from marine species. And in fact, most of the species and most of the fossil record of Mississippi is marine. Um, but we do find dinosaur fossils on occasion. And uh, JT, you asked me to call in about a year or so ago. I was on the road doing work on dinosaurs in northeast Mississippi, and we talked about a particular tooth, if you'll recall, that made national news. Uh, and it was of a horned dinosaur. And that was a first, not just for Mississippi, but for eastern North America. And it, uh, it tells us a lot about just one little tooth told us a lot about the configuration of North America because everyone always thought horned dinosaurs were limited to western North America. But now we know that they were in eastern North America. So, yeah, going out there and documenting everything that people report. The uh, paleontology program at the museum, was that always an original part of the museum? It was not. Uh, although fossils were brought to the museum for the longest time, um, <coughs> Fanny Cook in the 1930s corresponded with the Smithsonian about fossil whale bones from Goshen Springs, Mississippi. Um, and wildlife officers, there are reports and notes in the collection, at least those notes that weren't destroyed by the 79 flood when the museum was on Jefferson Street, we do have notes of uh, other wildlife officers encountering things. Um, you know, the wild, wildlife officers back then were not equipped with that kind of thing. But uh, nowadays, they always have a mandatory tour of the collections so that they can be introduced to uh, what they might be approached with when they're out in the field. But yeah, uh, there had been a need. Uh, I have a, if I can read just a brief little clip sure. from a newspaper. This is uh, William H. Moore with the Mississippi Office of Geology. He was the director of that department. And this uh, from a 1969 newspaper article where uh, Moore states that Mississippi has a wealth of fossil, mineral, and rock materials that are as beautiful and importantly and important academically as any place in the world, yet we have no place to display this material so that the scientific community and general public can study it and see it. Uh, again, Moore said that in 1969. Uh, the Office of Geology was not equipped with a budget to handle that sort of thing, but there was a, a grassroots in interest with the museum to start such a program there, and it was partly inspired by the discovery of fossil whale bones by the Mississippi Gem and Mineral Society, which is based here in Jackson. So it was a lot of public interest, um, Mississippi Gem and Mineral Society, from whom we see, received their fossil collection, was sort of the seed of the uh, museum's collection. And uh, all of these people calling in and writing in saying, we want to see what's being found in Mississippi. Because prior to 1978, it was all leaving the state. The Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History was here in 69 through 71, digging out whale bones out of Scott County. And uh, the Smithsonian had been coming down in years previous, uh, taking away our fossils. All to the better end, but we wanted some to stay in Mississippi, and that's why we exist. All right, we're going to continue more with George Phillips, who is the paleontologist at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. All right, you ready? See, I'm not looking. P-A-L-E-O-N-T-O-L-O-G-I-S-T. A plus. That's pretty good, JT. <laughs> That's pretty good. How about that? Um, the paleontology, paleontology, paleontology program uh, that is there at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, George, are all the fossils there from Mississippi? 
No, we have a, quite a few things from out of state, uh, mostly the adjoining states because of the uh, geology we share with adjoining states. Obviously, these uh, sediments uh, run independent of politics <laughs> and prior to politics. So um, we often go into Alabama, Arkansas, and Tennessee. But more often than not, I'm networking with collectors who are or more often as, as opposed to traveling to those places. Um, I'm networking with the collectors just outside of the state line, and um, they are sharing this information about what they discover, and, and we get donations from out-of-state collectors as well as in-state collectors. And some of these guys are and ladies are, are very astute. Uh, they have uh, many of them have reached the level of amateur paleontologist or amateur geologist and actually gone above that. Um, and it's it's good to have good competent uh, amateurs out there that know how to record the data, document with pictures. Of course, cameras are very handy these days on our phones, and so I encourage them to do a lot of documentation when they discover something. Uh, you got a you kind of got famous there and got on national TV programs with some discoveries. Uh, tell me about some of those and and what that was all about. Well, uh, I guess the first big one that got a lot of attention well all of them i think were mostly dinosaur bones but the first big one was the american pickers in uh, 2010 uh asked us to uh come up to nashville tennessee they just moved their um their base of operations from iowa to nashville and we got to see their new digs there at the old marathon uh, automotive manufacturing plant downtown in the old downtown district and inside that old automotive plant, they had a dinosaur bone that they wanted me to check out. And it was purchased at a, a Ripley First Monday flea market uh, a couple of years previous. And, uh, and they needed it identified. So we went on air and, and identified it for them. And I'd ask the uh, field producer beforehand, would the guys, uh, Frank and Mike, be interested in donating it to the museum? Well, she said, well, they weren't ready to commit. And what they did, they, did, they intentionally waited till. Uh, we were on air and recording so that they could see the reaction on my face when they said, yes, mm. we will donate and return this Mississippi dinosaur bone to the great state of Mississippi, which they did. And it's been uh, prominently on display in the collections since 2013. And it's the uh, femur or I'm sorry, it's the uh, tibia or uh, shin bone of a very large adult duck billed dinosaur. And it got a lot of press. Uh, we had even uh, one uh, congressman come by and want to see that bone. Um, and let's see. And then a couple of years ago, we made this discovery of a small dinosaur tooth with a big story to tell in the sense that it was from a type of dinosaur that was unknown from eastern North America, really from uh, east of the Great Plains. Um, and this little tooth uh, told a story about sea level rise and sea level fall uh, about 65, 66 million years ago. So we now know, or at least we're pretty certain, that there was a land bridge connecting the otherwise, or up till then, isolated eastern North America to western North America prior to the Rocky Mountains, and that this land bridge occurred when there were still dinosaurs roaming around. Um, this little tooth is just a little unassuming little thing, but uh, it created a lot of hubbub and we got a lot of press out of it. We made casts of it and circulated it with uh, scientists all around the country. And you can download a reproduction, a facsimile print. Uh, if you've got access to um, a computer, you can download a copy of this tooth from a website called Morphosource. All you have to do is plug in uh, Mississippi dinosaur tooth, and you'll go right to this horn dinosaur tooth at morphosource.com. Yeah, and there are other discoveries from the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science Paleo program. They've become very important, too, haven't they? They have. Not all of them are dinosaurs, but people like to hear about the dinosaurs. Uh, some people might find my research kind of droll because I'm working on the lowly sea creatures on the seafloor, like crabs and oysters and things like that. I, my main research is looking at how these communities were comprised 66 million years ago or 60 million years ago. That's kind of the time frame that I, most of my research occurs in. So I'm looking at uh, about when the dinosaurs became extinct and just after they became extinct, looking specifically at the organisms that, although they lived at the same time as the dinosaurs, they were living on the seafloor way away from the dinosaurs. 
Uh, we've even discovered uh, dinosaur bones in these deposits that were being munched on by the creatures that, that I've been studying. So we've got a, um, a couple of papers already released this year um, in collaborations that I have with these museums and paleontologists outside of, outside of the state uh, on fossil crabs from primarily northeast Mississippi, but also Newton, Mississippi, here in central Mississippi between Jackson and Meridian. Um, we've got another crab paper coming out on fossil crabs from the Baldwin area and the Blue Springs area. And we've described uh, at least eight new species in this up upcoming paper, including um, more than half of these species named after the people um, that found them. Um, and that's what we often do is uh, name these new species after people that discover them. You'd think we discovered everything by now. Um, certainly almost uh, uh, no year goes by when they report a new living species, but we're constantly reporting fossil species. And that's the, been the bulk of my work lately. And it's hard to keep up with it, JT. I've got mounds and mounds of projects that need to be published. Why is it so important we study fossils? We've got a couple minutes left here, so we need to hurry. Okay. Um, well, they document a time for which the only record we have are, are these skeletal remains and sometimes traces. An example of a trace would be uh, fossil poop. And, of course, all the four- to eight-year-old kids know the name of what fossil – the scientific name for fossil poop is coprolite. Um but we're studying not just the fossils themselves, but these remains, and we're trying to reconstruct what, not just what these ancient organisms look like, for which we have no modern counterparts, but also these uh, communities that they composed, how they interacted with one another. Basically, the ecology of these ancient seafloors that are cropping out in a ditch somewhere, or in a creek bank somewhere, or beneath, say, for example, the, um, the new history museum downtown. When they put in the pilings there, they hit a marine fossil bed. And uh, David Dockery at the Office of Geology and myself have been studying the sediments that came out of that piling hole uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, we're reconstructing what life looked like in downtown Jackson uh, some 37 million years ago. And I, I think it's important because people want to know. Um, it, it's, uh, it helps us understand a lot about the present and where we're heading in the present as well. All right. What are you currently working on right now? Right now I'm working on sea urchins, uh, another seafloor dweller. And we're describing some new species that occur in Texas and Mississippi. And they're very rare. Uh, they've eluded uh, previous uh, paleontologists who've studied these same sediments. Um, but they didn't... Uh, uh, miss my gaze and the gaze of a Texas collector who's been helping me with the project. Um, we found some very rare things together or remotely apart from one another, and we put all this in together into a project that will hopefully be published early next year. And finally, if our listeners want to learn more about the work you do at the museum, what can they do to, to do that? What can they do to find out more? Well, it's better just to Google my name uh, or Mississippi and fossils and paleontology, just basic keywords like that, and uh, you can see the research online. Some of the research is posted at the website, but I haven't updated my page in quite a few years. Um, but if you just Google my name, the museum's name, you'll end up at the right places to see what kind of things people are finding in Mississippi. And, and I need to add that I don't find most of these. I'd say more than 85% uh, of what we're reporting are found by people like you, JT, just your average Joe that happens to be maybe accidentally finding the fossils out hunting, uh, and then they end up fossil hunting, and then the bug bites, and they're doing it for the rest of their lives. Well, there you go. Thank you for being here with us today, George. I really appreciate that. George Phillips, the paleontologist at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. And uh, it sounds like a lot of fun. Keep up the good work. Thank you, JT.